us. My name is Brad, and I've got the privilege of serving as the lead campus pastor here. And so I want to welcome you to church today, whether you're with us in person. We're so glad to have you here. Or if you're watching with us online today, we're so grateful for your, your ability to join with us. We, we believe that God has a lot in store for us today, and we're really excited for all that's going to take place while we're here. And so I want to invite you, whether you're watching at home or whether you're watching here in person, to, to really... Take a moment and just prepare your heart and your mind before God and just, God, whatever it is you have for me today, God, God, that's what I want as we, as we spend some time together today. If you're watching online, I want to encourage you to take the, the steps that you need to take in order to, to be present, to participate, to, to be a part of what we're doing. It can be so easy to stand back at a distance and to, to just watch a service. But I want to encourage you to take the steps that you need to take in order to just lean in to being a part of our service, even from your home. Make sure that, that you are participating as best you can. Sing, say amen, take notes, stand up if you like. Don't do laundry. Don't do other things that can take away from your, your ability to be a part of the service. And I want to also invite you, if you're watching online, to take the step to invite your friends and family, your neighbors and people to, to be a part simply by sharing our service or by starting a watch party if you're watching on Facebook. But make sure to make a point of just being willing to, to invite everyone you know because we don't know what God's going to do with our humble offerings for him. Now, if you're here with us today, I want to thank you for, for being a part of our in-person gatherings today. And I want to invite you to, as, as we're going to move through the service, and we're going to have some time of music and some time of singing and, and some time of preaching from the Word and, and all of that, I want to invite you to, to respond however you personally feel like you need to respond in, the, in that context. And what I mean by that is, if you would like to stay seated, stay seated. If you would like to just listen, just listen, is, is we're not going to look for any kind of strong corporate response from our, our fellowship because we just want to provide people with a space where they can be comfortable. And we know in these times, different people have a different sense of what's comfortable and what's not. So I want to invite you to respond however you feel like you need to respond. And the last, the other thing that I just want to let you know is at the conclusion of our service today, I do need to encourage you, to implore you to, to not spend time fellowshipping inside of this space. Is, is the government has asked us as, as part of our, our ability to be open is that we not spend, a lot, spend time inside these enclosed spaces. But what we are going to have is we're going to have chairs available out back and there's just two doors right here and you can, can spend some time fellowshipping out there as long as you'd like. The pizza place opens at three. So the service will be over long before that. But if you hang around for a few hours, you can get some pizza next door if you really start to get hungry. But, but we're, you're welcome to just stay and spend some time together. Just if we can refrain from doing it inside here, that would be wonderful. Now, before we worship, I just want to take a quick couple of moments and just share with you a couple of announcements of things that are going on inside of our, our church fellowship. A couple of things that I want to let you know. But one is an event, and then two are more sort of like... Pra no, not practical, you'll see. Um, the first thing that I want to let you know is this Wednesday night, coincidentally, is our Wednesday night prayer. And so we're going we're gonna to have two options for how you'd like to join us. Is, is we are going to open up the church, and so we're going to be sitting in our socially distanced spaces where we can pray together. But you're also welcome to join us online. We're going to have both options available through our website. You'll be able to connect to a Zoom room. And so whatever is more comfortable for you, or whatever is easier for you, if you live in Iracana and want to join us, or, or if, if getting here for 7 o'clock is more difficult, you can join us online just by clicking through Zoom, and you can be a part of our prayer meeting, or you can join us in person, whatever you would prefer. And that's Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. Now, here's the, the two things that are a little more abstract. That's a good word for them. Um, one thing that I want to invite you to do is, is over the course of the last five months, which is pretty wild that it's been almost five months since we've really been able to be together. It may have been a long time since people in the church have seen your face have heard your voice. Now, some are in regular contact, but not everybody. And so what I want to invite you to do, and I know that this is a little abstract and it's a little bit like, oh, they don't want that from me. We do want it from you. If you're watching this or if you're here, we want this from you. Just record a couple second video, up to 30 seconds, but no more than that. Just your family saying hi to your church family. 
Just, just, hi, Cornerstone, love you, miss you, and let us know how you're doing, and let us see your face and hear your voice, and, and then hopefully each week we'll be able to have just a little family moment where, where a couple people from church are, are going to be able to show a little video of everybody saying hi to each other, but we want to take a moment and reintroduce ourselves, is, is it's probably going to be a while before everybody's back together, and, and everybody's comfortable being back together, but we don't want to allow that time and that distance to pull us apart, so I want to invite you just to take a couple of second video. I'm not looking for 10 minutes of family. In fact, please don't do that. Um, no more than maybe 30 seconds. But just record your, hi, Cornerstone. Nice to see you. And let us know if there's any big changes or anything that's going on. If you want to introduce us to your new baby or, or whatever it is that's going on, just let us know what, what's going on in your life so that we can celebrate with you and remember you and say hi. And, and if you just want to send those to me, and you can do that through our website. And if you have any problems on sending it, just let me know. Just send me an email or a message, and I'll make sure to help you do that. That. The last thing that I want to do is, is I want to let you know about is over the month of August is, is we really want to reach out and, and have God speak to us in a really prophetic way. Is, is we be, I believe that God wants to encourage his congregation over the month of August. And so what I want to ask you to do is to, between now and, and the end of August, so there's lots of time in there, but, but between now and then, really ask God if he's got something to speak to you for his church. And then let me know. And we'll make sure to get that out to the congregation. But what I really believe is that God has asked us to set August aside as a month of prophetic encouragement. That, that God is going to speak to us and encourage us and, and really minister to us throughout the month of August prophetically. Now, what that can look like is maybe it's a full-on prophetic, thus saith the Lord. Maybe it's God just places on your heart a scripture, a verse. Maybe it's for someone, maybe it's for everyone. But if you would just be an intentional about saying, God, would you speak to me for our church, God, if you have something to say to me for our church, just invite him to speak to you. And when, when and if he does, and if you think, I think this might be, just let me know, and we'll make sure to, to share that out through the congregation, because we really do believe that God wants to speak to us, and I believe he wants to encourage us as a body of believers for the month of August. That's all I'm going to share with you this morning. There is lots of other things going on in the life of our church, and you can go to cornerstonefoursquarechurch.com and, and click on Airdrie, and you'll see all of the things that we've got going on there. Or you can subscribe to our newsletter through the same place, and that will totally keep in touch with everything that's going on. Now, before Jordan comes to lead us in worship, I'm just going to take a moment and open our service in prayer. Father God, we come to you today as your children, and God, we are so excited for all that you're going to do in us and through us today. God, we know that, that even though we may have to be socially distant from each other, God, we know and we recognize that there's no need for you to be distant from us. And so, God, we pray that you would send your spirit into our, our, our lives right now, into our hearts, and just begin to minister, to speak to us, God, to open us up, to cause us to be good ground for you to speak to us today. God, we know that through worship, and through your word, God, you will communicate with us. You will speak to us. You will change us. And so, God, we are so excited for all that you're going to do. God, come and be and work in this place today. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good morning, Cornerstone family. Um, yeah, just to keep pounding on what Brad is, is saying, that this is, <clears throat> with this season, really want to double down that worship is not karaoke. Um, that just because there's words on the screen doesn't mean you have to say them <laughs> or sing them. Uh, maybe there's other words on your heart that need expression, and these just kind of springboard off of that. Um, maybe there's silence you can feel about prayer or whatever, but just we don't want you to think this is a rote thing that you have to be a part of. Um, um, yeah, we want you to worship, not just to sing. Um, and so with that, we're going to ask you whatever posture you want to take. Um, but we're going to, we're up here, we're going to sing. Um, 
and uh, and start our morning.
God, we confess this morning that you have come. That there's space for you in this room. That there's space for you in our homes. That you're invading all of these places. We come with expectant hearts. Who can stop?
That you weren't by my side There wasn't a day That you let me fall And all of my life Your love has been true And with all of my life I worship you There wasn't a day That you weren't by my side there wasn't a day that you let me fall And all of my life, your love has been true And with all of my life, I worship For heaven's fun Spun creations, pride and adoration, treasures woven by his love. His careful hands they hold us safe within his promise, calling end of destiny. And I will sing of my 
I'll remember how far you carried me from beginning until the end. You are faithful, faithful to the end. All of my life, even the sea. That's all my heart to Raise my fears really How precious is that grace that I first believe. My chains are gone
They sail to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the lake from Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus? Son of the Most High God, I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into solitary places. Jesus asked him, what is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him 
and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. The demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. And he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. And all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, Return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. The encounter that I want to look at this morning is, is not just an encounter that Jesus had with someone. Um, but more than the one, I want to look at the encounter that Jesus had with something. That this, this summer, we're looking at encountering Jesus and what it means when we, when we enter, or when, when we enter into the presence of God, but also when the presence of God enters into us and into our lives. And so we're going to be talking this morning about this, this encounter that this man had with Jesus. But this man had a story. He, he had a life situation, he had a circumstance that defined him. He was demon-possessed. And so Jesus encounters this man, but he also encounters this multitude of demons that took up residence inside of this man's body. And this encounter takes place in Luke chapter 8, verses 27 through 39. If you want to turn there or, or want to follow along with, with where we're going to be, you're welcome to do that. But before we look at those specific verses, there's just one verse I want to take a look at that's just a few verses earlier in verse 22, because it, it makes an important point of something I want to draw out for us as we move, as we move through this, as something to be keenly aware of that, that's really important to understand as we move through this wild story. Actually, Luke chapter 8, verses 22 through 56, all of these verses is a really amazing chunk of scripture. In fact, I would encourage you to read Luke chapter 8 at some point over the next little while because it is, among other things, the record of four different miracles that Jesus performs. He seems to go from one miracle to another miracle to another miracle and another miracle, and he demonstrates his power over the world around us. See, nature, the demonic, sickness, and even death are all shown to be under the authority of Jesus Christ in these verses. It's a very amazing passage of Scripture to read about the amazing power that God, or the God we serve, wields in our, in our world and, and that he wields for us. These Scriptures show us how there is nothing that's beyond God. But in Luke chapter 8, verse 22, it says this, one day Jesus got into a boat with his disciples and said to them, let's go across the lake to the other side of the lake. So they set out. Jesus, this one evening, decides that, it, that it's, it's time to move. It's time to go on. So he climbs into this boat and he says to his disciples, let's go. But let's go to the other side of the lake. So the disciples get, climb into the boat and they set off 
across the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee, it's not a huge body of water. It's not a sea in the grand scheme of things that we think about it. It's, it's only about 21 kilometers long, and it's only about 12 kilometers wide. So it's not tiny, but it's not this huge, massive body of water. But in verse 23 and 24 and 25 record a storm that hits the boat. And the disciples, many of whom were professional fishermen that lived their lives on the water, this storm comes, and and it's such a great storm that these professional men of the water are afraid for their lives. And it records that Jesus is sleeping, and they wake him up, and they say, don't you care? And, And Jesus, with just a couple of words, rebukes the wind, and the water and the storm ceases. And then Jesus goes on to this experience and then continues to have these other experiences. And the reason why I wanted to go back to verse 22 just for a moment is because it's important to note that this little trip that Jesus and the disciples were about to take and everything that was to come after it, it was Jesus' idea. These things weren't just things that happened to them. But Jesus said, we need to get into a boat, and we need to get into a boat and go right now. Right into the eye of the storm. Right into the storm that was coming. Jesus is God. He knows it's coming. Right into this this encounter with this man that they're about to see. Nothing that we see that transpires was just something that happened to the disciples. It was all intentional. For Jesus, it wasn't something unexpected. The storm that was about to come was not going to be news to Jesus. The man they were going to encounter isn't going to be this incredible, wild experience. Jesus would say, I never saw this coming. Jesus, this is all Jesus' plan. He says, we need to go, and we need to go right now, right into the storm that's about to come, right into this encounter with this man. And it's important to know that for two things. One, because Jesus said it was going to all happen, And two, Jesus was prepared for all of it. Nothing that happens here catches Jesus off guard. The disciples and all the people around may be entirely caught off guard, but Jesus was not. And so verse 27, we dive into our text today. As Jesus stepped aside, a certain man from the town met him who was possessed by demons. For a long time, this man had worn no clothes and had not lived in a house but among the tombs. So the disciples and Jesus, they sail across. They have this incredible story of this storm where they're afraid. And Jesus speaks up and says, peace be still. And the storm is calmed and everything is good. And then they land. And immediately they're welcomed by a naked, homeless, living in a cemetery guy. This is, this is what greets them on the other side. They're relieved. They've made it through the storm. Oh, wasn't that a wild experience? They step out of the boat. And it just gets weirder. It just gets weirder. This crazed man storms out of the tomb. Wild hair, bloody wrists, scratched skin. Naked in the cemetery, arms flailing, voice screaming. Can you picture the disciples as they see this man maybe having a gulp kind of moment and taking a step back onto the boat and saying, where's that storm again? Let's go do that again. Sure, that was, that was scary, but, but we know that. Let's, let's go do that again. When Jesus said to the disciples, let's go over to the other side of the lake, he knew exactly where he was going, and he knew exactly who they were going to find there. So then we read in verse 28. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and shouted with a loud voice, Leave me alone, Jesus, Son of the Most High God. I beg you, do not torment me. For Jesus had commanded the impure spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained, he had er, chained hand and foot and kept under guard. He had broken his chains and been driven by the demon to solitary places. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, because many of demons had entered him. And they began to beg him not to order them to, to, part, to depart to the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and the demonic spirits begged Jesus to let them go into them. 
the demon inside this man, this evil spirit that's, that's possessed him, immediately recognizes Jesus. But doesn't recognize the man Jesus. Doesn't, I've seen this face before. But he recognizes immediately Jesus, the Son of God. And the power and the authority that Jesus had was immediately evident to this demon. And he knew who he was dealing with. And we see that this demon's response to the presence of Jesus, to the person of Jesus, the, the man screams out and drops to the ground. Exactly, Caden. Dreams out and drops to the ground, screaming and begging for Jesus' mercy. And the demon knows who Jesus was. And, and he, Jesus asked the demon's name, and the demon tells him that he's not one, but there's a whole bunch of them who've taken up residence in this man's body. And they tell Jesus that they, they're called legion. We also get an idea that, that for what life was like for this poor man. Like, we can get caught up in, in all the whole supernatural part of all of this, but, but there's a human being here, too. Scripture records that, that the people of the area had tried to restrain this man by putting him in chains and shackles. The man being shackled and restrained would mean that he was undoubtedly violent and a danger to the people around him. But the strength of the demon inside this man was so strong that the man had been able to break out of his shackles. In Mark's account of the story, it tells us that no one could bind him anymore. That they had given it their best shot and they didn't know what else to do. They couldn't do anything. I'm sure this was at the detriment to his own physical body. And he finally escapes, only to, to live and hide out in a cemetery outside of town. And so Jesus cast the demon out of this man and, and set him free from this awful torment in his life. Now, we hear nothing from the disciples out of this encounter. Even Peter, who is prone to speak whatever the situation, just keeps his mouth shut. I, I can picture them standing and watching this whole event with their mouths and their eyes wide open, just looking and are, are you seeing that? Like, th this is just this crazy, intense moment, having a front row seat to what must seem like a battle for the ages. Good versus terrifying evil. Light versus dark. The kingdom of heaven doing battle with the kingdom of darkness. What would happen? But the demon does something odd. The, the demon who had taken over this man's life asks for mercy. Mercy. There's no battle. There's no struggle. There's no fight for exorcism. In fact, we don't even read what Jesus says. It just says he comes across this man, and then it says he casts the demon out of him. The demon knows who Jesus is, knows his power, knows his authority. The demon knows there can be no fight. James, in the book of James, it will tell us that demons are well aware of Jesus and they know his power and they're terrified by it. And here, here we see that playing itself out. Jesus, in an act of mercy on this man's life, was going to cast out these demons and free him. But in this moment, these evil spirits ask Jesus for mercy. They don't want to be thrown into to what is called the abyss. And they ask Jesus to, to show them what they would see as mercy and ask to be thrown into a herd of pigs that are grazing nearby. The, these demons recognize that Jesus had the authority and the power to simply at a word do with these demons whatever it is that he wanted to do. And they begged him to not send them to the abyss, but, but to send them into these pigs. Now, there's lots of, of significances that people can draw on this point in the story, that the pigs are unclean animals and the evil spirits are sent to them. Some people may look at the symbolism of the pigs running into the water and, and water often being used as a metaphor for the Holy Spirit in Scripture. And Some will say that the pigs jumping off the cliff show the violence and hatred that these demons were full of. But what I would like to focus on for just a moment is Jesus' response to this strange on so many levels, request by these demons. 
the demonic spirits beg Jesus to let them go into these pigs. And so what does Jesus, with the power of the entire universe at hand, at a word he can do whatever he wants to this, can deal with this situation in whatever way he wants to, what does he do? He let them go. Jesus listened to these evil spirits. They begged him. Jesus heard what they had to say. And he gave them what they wanted. They asked Jesus, send us into the pigs. And Jesus said, okay. Now, I am not Jesus. Amen. There you are. And I don't claim to know better than Jesus. But I think a good piece of advice would be if you ever find yourself dealing with a demon, don't do what they ask. If you ever are confronted by an evil spirit, don't do what they ask you to do. But here, said to Jesus, Jesus, show us mercy. And Jesus says, all right, here's mercy. And then the story concludes. Verse 33. So the demons came out of the man and went into the pigs, and the herd of pigs rushed down the steep slope into the lake and drowned. Jesus could do whatever he wanted to do to these demons. Sure, one option would have been to do what they asked, but why would Jesus give these evil spirits what they wanted? Why would the Son of God relent and allow these demons to enter into these pigs like they had asked? What I would assert for you this morning yep, this morning, that is that Jesus would seemingly give these demons what they asked for, for the very same reason that Jesus was casting these demons out to begin with. At the beginning of our story, we looked at this scripture where I said it was important to note that this was an intentional journey for Jesus. Jesus knew this man would be waiting for him. Jesus knew the situation, and Jesus knew what was going to transpire. And the intention of all of this was important because Jesus arrived on those shores with the intention of casting out these evil spirits from this man, and I believe responding to the demons the way that he did for one reason. Because Jesus was on a mission of mercy. Jesus was on a mission of mercy. Jesus was compelled to show mercy on this man that had been tormented by these evil spirits. And Jesus was compelled to show mercy so much that he sailed across the Sea of Galilee in a storm to get there. And Jesus was compelled by mercy even more to come down and set foot here on earth to save his creation that had turned its back on him. Jesus was here to show mercy. When Jesus healed the sick, when Jesus fed the hungry, when Jesus allowed the crippled to walk, when he gave sight to the blind, when he allowed the deaf to hear, when he called prostitutes, tax collectors, and sinners into relationship with him, when Jesus loved the unlovable, forgave the unforgivable, and welcomed the unwelcomable, when Jesus saves those around him who cannot save themselves, he didn't do this because they deserved it, earned it, or have equal value to it. He does it because... Of his mercy. In Titus chapter 3, it says this But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. And I think in this passage, we get a picture of just how serious Jesus takes this idea of mercy. Jesus sets off on a mission of mercy that leads him and his disciples through a storm that threatens his and his disciples' lives because in his mission of mercy, no storm was going to stop him. Jesus lands on the shore and begins his act of mercy by casting a demon out of a man who had been suffering from this oppression for years. 
And in the midst of this, Jesus shows mercy even to the demons. Talk about mercy. I want to say this to all of us today, to you and to me. God has mercy for you this morning. His mercy is greater than your need for it. We all need it, each and every one of us. And like the man in this passage, who I know we haven't focused much on, is we've been really focused on this this supernatural encounter that takes place, but, but there is a man in this story. And like this man, when God's mercy comes to us, just like we saw with Zacchaeus last week, See, over and over again, as we move through these stories, a lot of them are going to have this same sort of form where there is this person who's known as this thing. Last week, it was Zacchaeus, the sinner, the tax collector. This week, it's this demon-possessed man. We don't even know his name. But everybody knows him and knows who he is because he is the demon guy. He's the tax collector guy. But in the midst of these stories, what we see is Jesus enters into the picture, confronts head on the identity that they have been given by the world, confronts that, changes it, and gives them a new identity. And so when we encounter Jesus, when we encounter his mercy, it will change everything about us. This man goes from wild, violent, angry, terrifying man beast to sitting quietly and calmly at the feet of Jesus. Verse 35 says, and so the people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus. They found the man from whom the, the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, clothed and in his right mind. And so that, that's our first takeaway from our time together today. If you're here today and, and you don't know the mercy of Jesus, if you don't know what it is to be cleansed, to be set free from the things in your life that shouldn't be there, today God has mercy for you. Today God's mercy can reach you. And just like this, man, in a moment, your whole world, your whole life can change. But the story doesn't end there. We we have this picture of this man's total life transformation and the people from the community see it and they recognize it. They see this man and they see he is different. He is not the same anymore. Something has happened. They see the man. They see the change in his life. They see what Jesus had done. And then they have a response to this that's seemingly insane but yet somehow totally predictable. Because it's people, it's us, and we respond weird. Verse 37 says, Then all the people of the region of the Gerasians asked Jesus to leave. To leave them. Because they were overcome with fear. Jesus performs this amazing miracle that no one else is able to do. Everyone had given their best shot to do something with this man. No one could do anything. Jesus sets him free. People come, they witness it, they see it, they see the man sitting at Jesus' feet, totally changed. And they look at Jesus and they say, I think you need to go. I I think you, you need to go now. The people don't understand Jesus' mercy. They can't grasp what just happened. And instead of being inspired to ask, Jesus, would you show me the same mercy? Instead of doing what others did and bring Jesus all of their sick and needy and looking to Jesus for help, they tell Jesus it's time to get to getting. Mercy can be a confounding thing for people who are not familiar with it. In our world then and and still today, people don't understand the change that mercy can make in someone's life. And rather than seeing this as a miracle that extends to each one of them, they're freaked out because our pigs. They, They don't understand what has taken place and rather than embracing this miracle for what it was, it scares the people, scares them that this man is now calm. 
that scares them. That he was who he was and now he is who he is scares them. That this crazed individual is now sitting at the feet of Jesus and they ask Jesus to leave. And so Jesus leaves. Verse 37, so he got into the boat and left. This was Jesus, we need to go to the other side of the lake. They sail through this storm, this incredible storm where they think they're going to die. Jesus has this wild encounter. And the result of it is they say, it's time for you to go. And Jesus says, all right. And gets back into his boat and goes to leave. Jesus was on a mission of mercy for this man. This man's story sailed all the way across this lake in the middle of a storm that they thought they were going to die simply to set this one man free. And then he turns to leave. The man whom Jesus saves wants to travel with Jesus and wants to go with Jesus, wants wants to stay with the man who changed his life, rescued him from the clutches of Satan and set him free because of his mercy. That This man woke up that morning essentially in hell and in an instant he was free. It says the man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him, Jesus, but Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare what God has done for you. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole town what Jesus had done for him. Jesus' response to this man's desire to go with him is, is your second takeaway from our time together, from this encounter today. The man couldn't go with Jesus because Jesus had something for him to do. He needed to spread the word of what Jesus had done for him. To tell the world that Jesus had come and set him free. To tell the world, I woke up this morning in hell and met the Son of God. That Jesus rescued him and restored him. And for each one of us, for you today, if you know the mercy and grace of Jesus... That same reason that this man had is your same reason for being here today. That's why we are here today. Jesus has left us behind, has left us here now. said, you're not to come with me yet. You're still here. You're still here in the now. I need you to stay there because you need to proclaim what has happened to you throughout the whole town. You need to proclaim the change that's taken place in your life throughout your whole city. Go and tell everyone who's listened what has taken place in your life, what has taken place in your story, how you were bound and now you're free, how you had chains and now they're gone, how you've been set free by Jesus. Go proclaim it to the whole town, to Airdrie, to Iracana, to wherever it is that you live, Go proclaim it to your work, to your neighborhood, to wherever you're from. Go and proclaim what has taken place to you. Jesus' mercy is something the world needs to know about. It's something the world needs. And we, like this man, have been given the task of sharing this mercy with the world. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you have a heart for the one that's left, the the 99 and the one. God, I thank you that, that for each one of us, just like this man, we were the one. We were the one that you were willing to cross the Sea of Galilee and face death in a storm, that you were willing to do all of that just to rescue us. And God, I thank you that more than that, you weren't just willing to face death, to rescue us. But God, I thank you that you experienced death in order to rescue each one of us who knows and understands and who has accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. God, I thank you that our testimony is not just that you caused the storm to be calmed, like in this story, but that you took on death and hell and you experienced what it was to give your life for someone else. And I thank you that each one of us have this story of this God who went through everything in order to save me. 
And God, I thank you that for each one of us, we can have the same testimony as this man, that Jesus simply came to save my life, to change me, and that's all that, that he has for you, is he just wants a changed life inside of me. And so God, I, I pray that you would help us to not take our experience and take what's happened to us and take everything that you've done and somehow keep it bottled up inside. Not somehow file it away in the back of our mind to say, isn't it a great story? But God, I pray that if you, as you've given us the same task as this man, that we are to go into all of the towns that we're in, all of the places, go into all the world and proclaim the difference you've made in our lives. God, I pray that you would give us each the courage and the boldness to be able to speak about the difference that Jesus Christ has made in each one of us. God, I pray that we would be effective in communicating this story to our communities, to, to our neighborhoods, to our families, to our friends, to our co-workers. God, help us to, to be committed to going into the whole town and sharing what Jesus has done for us. God, we love you, and we're so grateful for the difference that you've made in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here today or if you're watching online today and you've never experienced the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus, if you've never experienced what it is to have a life change and a transformation, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I would love a chance to pray with you and to introduce you to him and to, to share his 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 life-changing mercy with you and to begin you down this new road of understanding what it is to have a Lord and a Savior who loves you to the ends of the world and back again. I'd love to, to introduce you to Jesus Christ. And if you're here today and, and your, your story is that you know Jesus, but that you still need to know the love and, and the mercy of Jesus in, in a new way in your life, I'd love a chance to pray with you for that as well. I want to thank you for, for being here with us today. I want to thank you for watching online. We're so grateful for, for all of the ways that we can connect as a church family. I just want to remind you about our family moments. Take a moment, even today, and just, just make a quick little video and send it to me, and we'll make sure that we can see and communicate and love, love each other. But I want to thank you so much for being a part of our church family. We're so grateful that God brings us together. We are a family, and as family we go. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Have a wonderful week, and we will see you again really soon.